projects. I think Cassiopeia is one of the most interesting projects we had in, in World Package E, and I would have liked to make this accessible to a larger audience, including the SG, I'm sure that they'll be there in a minute. Um, we're also video recording this to forward it to, to other people who are interested. So we have, um, from Inaxis, we have uh, David and Samuel uh, from the University of Westminster. We have uh, Andrew and Graham, and we have Arturo from uh, Universidad de Politecnica de Madrid. And uh, I'll hand over to David for the introduction. All right. So the Cassiopeia project spanned during the last uh, two years and a half. We started before summer 2011, right in May. As you know, it's been carried out by Inaxis, University of Westminster, and the Universidad Politecnica de, de Madrid. The project is about trying different forms of designing operational concept, in particularly developing tool set to try those operational elements and go down to actual case studies and execute those case studies to analyze the performance of those elements of the operational concept. So in the presentation, what we are going to have is basically this part that it's five, ten minutes that I'm going to cover really quick. Then the three following slots are 20 minutes each, and those are the specific case studies. So we're going to jump over most of the work breakdown structure that typically is not that interesting, and we're going to focus specifically on the case studies, which is actually where the conclusions of the, of the projects are. And then we'll have five minutes of the, for the final remarks. Just to set up the scope of Cassiopeia, when we try to analyze a feature operational concept, we can do these four things, right? Basically, the current operational concept can be tried with the current traffic conditions. Traffic should be understood as the fleet mix, the route structure, the traffic levels, etc. So what we have today is obviously the traffic scenario that we have today and the current operational concept. And for the future, what we want to see is how a future operational concept behaves with the future traffic, So, which is what we have down there in the bottom right. However, there are other things that we need to analyze to understand the whole operational concept. One analysis that we can do is what we call the do-nothing scenario, which typically is used to analyze the risks involved in doing nothing and see how the current operational concept behaves with future levels of traffic. But we can do also an analysis of the short-term benefits, which is analyze how the current traffic behaves with new, with future operational concepts. So this is exactly what Cassiopeia lays down. So we got a certain elements of the future operational concept and we try them with current traffic scenarios. So what we did basically is selecting three operational scenarios of this future operational concept. We analyzed three scenarios for which we thought that there was no technology available to design them and that show some complexity understood as high level of interaction between elements and tried agent-based modeling as a technology to design that particular operational concept. So what we did in the first part of the project was actually analyzing these operational scenarios, and we'll see in a minute how we do it. Talking about agent-based modeling, we thought that it was interesting to include what's agent-based modeling and how this is done. Agent-based modeling is a field on computer science, and although there is a wide ambiguity in the definition of what agent-based modeling is, basically there are certain concepts like uh, autonomy of the agents, like uh, the fact that agents are independent, that they can take decisions uh, in their environment, etc., that allows to apply game theory in a wider sense than just developing analytical models. The way this is done is by building software architectures that support agent-based modeling technology, and those software architectures need to be built explicitly for each operational scenario. So this means that traditional tool sets like Excel or MATLAB or other technologies cannot model these operational scenarios and, and agent-based modeling of the self. As I said, what we did in the first part of the project was select these operational scenarios. From those operational scenarios, there is not a common understanding of what an agent-based modeling is. What we did is develop our own methodology on what agents are and how this can be modeled and explicitly define certain case studies which are particular instances and concrete examples. For that, we acquire the data, process the data to make sure that the case studies were complete and several scenarios within the case studies were considered. From that, we think that we've built a new paradigm in ATM modeling, especially taking into account the tools that we have today. 
We went several levels deeper in the project, not only selecting those operation scenarios and building the methodology, but also coding an actual tool set on which the case studies could be executed. These are basically the results that we are going to present today, which are these, uh, these five steps. The impact that we think that the project creates is a progress in the state of the art or ATM modeling for particular operational scenarios in which uh, complexity avoids uh, the design of those operational elements with traditional tools. Without getting into the details of the work breakdown structure, basically we have four blocks in the WBS and we run them consequentially, not, not in parallel. The first part that we did was select the operational scenarios and that was one of the highlights of the project. This was run by the University of Westminster and basically through a survey and, uh, and a meeting that we have in early 2012, uh, we consulted uh, 157 participants and they came out with a list of operational elements for which they thought that there were not enough tools to assess the performance. And out of this list, we selected three that we thought that they were interesting for us, that we were capable of running, that they were showing some complexity and again that there were a lack of tools to design them. Once we designed it that, we built a logical architecture of the different modules of the model and we went from the analyzing the regulations to the network to analyzing the performance or adjusting factors. This logical architecture ended up being detailed and this is one example on how detailed we went on how the different agents would need to interact with their environment and how they would need to follow the different parts of the regulation. From that part, we moved to the software design phase and that took from uh, requirements analysis and in initial design phases to actual system implementation and evaluation. And from that, we went down to the actual case studies. We selected three operational scenarios and one case study for each one of the operational scenarios. So what we're going to do now in the following part of the presentation is actually focus on those case studies which are where the conclusions of the project lay down. Is it on purpose that you start with case study two? Yes, I mentioned three case studies. So, but yeah, we started in a second, with a second case study uh, because Samu is going to give more details on what agent modeling is, more technical de details on the software infrastructure. So we thought that it was better just to have that part of the presentation first and Arturo and, and Graham will get into the results of case studies one and three but they won't get into the guts of the, of the software infrastructure. So that's why we, we are starting with case study two. Good catch. This will be the second part of the presentation today and first before actually talking about the second case study I want to talk a little bit about the software platform. Okay, um, some technical details about the platform and, and how it was designed from the software perspective. And yeah, well, the software was designed following the BDI model, which is a model, well, a methodology usually used for modeling agents and this kind of systems, and it's based in three main points. Each agent has a set of beliefs, desires, and intentions. These three elements define the agents. And then they all have individual goals, so they have their own purposes. So each agent has his own goal, individual. This is a common environment, which is the set of things that are common to each agent, so they perceive how everything changes around them. And they share the kind of send messages, messages between them and between the, also with the environment in order to, to achieve these kind of goals. And, well, this is the, the design methodology, which is... BDI is usually, it's mainly structured for computer science and we apply this methodology to the particular case of uh, Cassiopeia. And well, the software platform uses many different technologies already existent. We have two horizontal uh, modelers. One is the common for all three case studies and there's another mod mod modelers which are different for each case study. So first we have the agents. And they're specified in an ADF language, which is just a way to be able to specify these goals and intentions and everything. Then you have a simulation engine, which is the second block here. ADF, it's a part of XML language. Then you have a simulation engine, which is mainly written in JADEX, using JADEX. JADEX is a common platform also for agent modeling, which is written over Java. 
and there are some specific elements of the domain, of the AETM domain, which are also written in Java. And for modeling the environment, it's modeled in a database using MySQL, and so that the agents can access to the data in the environment, which is in a database. As I said, every case study has specific components only for that particular case study. This is uh, just to check the different languages and technologies that have been used in this project. It's important to point out that the definition of the agents is made in XML, which is a very easy language for almost anybody can write because it's not programming like it is. It's just a level language, so it's very easy to configure the agents. Also, it's important to notice that the engine is written over Java, which means high compatibility. You can run Java in almost every computer. Almost everything will run Java. And the database can be external as well because it's over MySQL, so you can have a database in Paris and run the model in Amazon cloud computing, no problem. Going to the second case study, this is called ATFM slot allocation as a tradable commodity. We study the possibility of letting the airlines to change their slots also with an economic compensation. The reason for this is because usually there's no linear relation between the cost and the delay. So when you use this FPFS, a first plan, first serve a prioritization, prioritization, you don't really optimize the cost. You just try to minimize the delay for each aircraft. But some aircraft might be cheaper than others, so some operators will accept more delay than others, depending on their own cost. So it's not optimal to try to minimize each delay using, I don't know, the same priority. So it's better to use the cost. But you cannot let the airlines to tell you their cost of each aircraft, so you have to design a way for them to negotiate this slot. So First part, we are going to design this uh, mechanism to allow the airlines to exchange the slots and we will see what, what happens here. So whenever we want to design this exchange mechanism between two or more participants, we have a number of properties we would like to fulfill of the system or, or mechanism. There are these three, which are common in game theory. You have an individual rationality, which means that no participant is forced to participate. It would mean that Maybe you get negative uh, paid off, but you, then you don't want to participate because you will get nothing, so you are not forced to participate. It's a desirable property of the, of the mechanism. Then you have budget balance, which means uh, you don't need external funds for your exchange mechanism. So, yeah, it has to be all internal. So you don't need external sources or sinks of economics, monetary or whatever. And then we have the last one with the incepting compatibility. And this is very important. It means that you cannot get a better situation by misrepresenting your cost or by being mistrustful or sending fake bids or trying to deceive the rest of the participants. It's impossible, bad thing is impossible to have the three properties at the same time. So even if you try really hard to find a perfect mechanism to exchange the slots, it won't be possible. It's been proven in the 80s, so down there you have the reference. So we just drop the third condition and design the mechanism to fulfill the first two, which is rather easy. Trying to fulfill the third condition is quite difficult, so we just fulfill the first two and let the third open for the moment. And in addition, we also designed a mechanism so we have these three other properties. So we have the minimum the disclosed information, which means that you don't reveal your cost, not all your costs, but just the minimum necessary to do the bid. And also, these bids will be anonymous, which means that the one which is receiving the bid doesn't know who is sending the offer. And at last, is uh, the solution has to be visible from the ATM perspective, so you just cannot bid for a slot which is impossible for you or it's just too late or it's just too early. So now we go to the mechanism as it is. First we distribute the slots using the current situation of PFS so we get each flight has the original delay as nothing else happens. Then second part each airline computes the cost internally for the rest of the slots that they can actually do and they place a bit of one slot but they do not communicate to the owner of the slot, okay? Just place a bid. They communicate this bid to an external coordinator, just 
I want this lot and I will pay this amount of money for it. Then this coordinator solves the bits from the very first slot to the second. So the, first, the owner of the first slot is communicated the highest bit for it and he will accept or just reject the bit. When this bit is solved, then we move to the second slot. The owner of the second slot is offered a higher amount that someone has bid for and then goes backwards to the very last slot, which yeah, probably doesn't have any bits. And then we continue to point two again until we get a number of rounds, which is typically five. Well, this is the first question. When you design this mechanism, you don't know how many rounds we should let this uh, procedure go. So we just make a guess five and then we use Cassiopeia to define to get which is the minimum number of rounds and until this stabilizes. And this the, from points two to four it's what we call a round. Okay? So several rounds here will configure one auction. So you bid for a change, you don't bid for the slot, you don't buy the slot, but you swap it to the slot that you yes. have yourself yeah. in order to guarantee that nobody remains without a slot at the end. Yeah, exactly. Do you have an idea how the results might have changed if your rationale would not have been to swap slots but to buy slots and then to sell your slot? May that have led to a different solution? It, it may happen that it, that way maybe you don't get an optimal solution in terms of the de delay because you may be wasting the slots that nobody really wants. This way you are always swapping, so the capacity is the same at the end. You're using all the slots. Now we can check our properties, and well, the first two, it's very easy to check. So no one is forced to participate because you just reject every bit, and you get the original. You just have to reject every bit, so you will stay at the first distribution of slots. The second is that you don't need an external fund because it's the alliance who pay the money for the slots for the swamping. But of course the third one will not be possible because due to the theorem. We know it's impossible. Maybe there's some behaviors that can be untrustful and will get to a better situation for the alliance. So the question now is to what extent does the third property not hold? So whatever that means. So we have now Cassiopeia comes into play for testing this concept of swapping economic compensation. So we design a number of scenarios to test different properties of this mechanism. Yeah, this is important. Each scenario will have a simulation attached. In each simulation we will define which is the ATM situation, which is the why there are ATFM slots or where this is happening and everything. And then each island will have a cost model based on University of Westminster work, previous work. So we also fix that into the model and we put the intention of each agent or airline into the model as well. This will be one simulation or case or the scenario. And then we run several auctions. Each auction will be like this real situation is happening one and over and over again. So we repeat this every auction for, let's say, 30 times. It's another thing we will get to that later. And every auction will consist in a number of rounds again. So we have, for the same situation, we have a number of functions and then we have rounds inside of it. So in every round, the island has to decide which slot they want to bid for and the amount. And also if they want to sell their own slot or not. And the important thing here is that after the number of rounds, every agent will get knowledge about the results of their actions. So it's not fixed that they always do the same thing. Depending on the result, maybe they bid for a slot that they didn't get it, so they try with another one, or maybe they wanted to pay a higher price. So it's up to the agents at the end. We just code how this system will evolve depending on the results. There will be airlines which will try to maximize or minimize the delay, no matter the cost, or there will be others which will try to always get a benefit just by a chain, no matter the delay. The good thing here is that the agents with adaptive behavior and the more simulation, the more action, the more rounds we run, the better the knowledge of these agents will become of the process. That's the main thing I would say about using agent-based uh, modeling techniques. Here. This is just to show you how these uh, strategies were defined. And show you is very easy, you just have to write that down in a table and then you pass them to XML, which is a very <coughs> easy process. You don't have to code anything really, just tell which is the slot you want to bid for and when you want to bid for that slot. So should be pretty straightforward to design new tactics or new strategies for future case studies. In total we run like eight scenarios. 
classified in four different categories. A calibration scenario in which we let all the agents to use the same goals, try using the same tactics, so they're not interfered between them. And we did it for four different tactics to see how the system developed. Then we run also an next scenario with no, there's no learning from the, from the agent. This is the fixed scenario. There's no actually learning, so just they play the same game over and over again. They just can change some parameters, but not the whole tactic. It's slightly more sophisticated than just no learning, but it's very basic learning, I would say. Then we have a sensitivity analysis with two different scenarios in which we change the behavior of some of the agents, not so many, but it's around 30% of the agents, and we want to know if the whole system will collapse because some of the agents change suddenly their behavior or not. And then we finally run, which is called a realistic scenario, which is something we just, with using the expert knowledge, then make an educated guess and try to see what this kind of island will behave this way. So we run it to get an approximation. This is not really the, the main purpose of, the, of this case study, to get a real situation in which we say, oh, if we implemented the system at the end, this island will do this and this other island will do that, and then we have, this is not the real goal, but we try anyway. And again, every scenario is also very easy to configure. You have to write a table with the number of rounds, the number of simulations. This is actions, in fact. It's, this is wrong. And then you parse it to XML and you run into the software. It's pretty straightforward. So it comes to findings. So after running this scenario, we analyzed all the results and this is our main findings we got. First of all, we got a cost reduction of about 30% in cost for the airlines after swapping, but also keeping the same total delay because we are always swapping slots. So the total delay will be the same. It's only the shape of the distribution which will change. And thus we found a critical point around 15 minutes and it's mainly that the flights below this threshold we try to swap slots with flight over 50 minutes. This is highly dependable of the cost model we are using, maybe, so it's something we have to be careful about. But it was surprisingly that across all the scenarios, we got this cross reduction on also these 15 minutes. It was a common tendency in almost every scenario. Finally, it's important also that we check that this colorative distribution making mechanism was self-regulated, so it means that there was no agent who was making profit at no limits, so it stabilizes it after a number of rounds, typically to three to five rounds. So it's not necessary to let the airlines to be swapping around slots for 30 rounds, just three to five will be enough. And also very important that there are no strategy to be dominant or monopolist. So there's no a good strategy, it depends on your cost estimation and also in the slots that you have or you want to bid. So there's no perfect way to do this. So it depends on your situation. I just want to ask a couple of things on the last slide um, because I think the future slides will depend on it. One is you talk about cost reduction and I know you referred to the work of Westminster but you didn't actually say what's, what's in that cost. How do you build up the cost? Yeah, it's a very simplified model, but also accounts for passenger cost, hard and soft, and also for non-passenger cost. Okay, fuel, and it's a very simplified model, but it accounts for passenger and non-passenger cost. Thank you. Okay, it's just that 30% is quite a, an impressive number, and yeah. I'm just wondering kind of what, what's beneath it. So it's relatively simplistic on costing, but the percentage indicates there's some real potential there from this method. Yeah, of course. This is just a way to put this in a very nice way in one line result, but the result is more and more involved. Yeah. So, yeah, if you, if you yeah. want, you can see the whole review and there are yeah, more details about this. Yeah. But, yeah, it's roughly around 30%, which was quite amazing. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's quite a significant result. So just a quick question on, on the term on the slide, as we're on this slide. Rocketed, what do you mean on the third bullet, that no indicator... Yeah. Rocket. Yeah, it Rocket. means that it didn't go up without limits. Like, I don't know, someone would just start in the set slots to get oh, another no. slot and then get more uh, money in exchange and then it will try to sell it again. Yeah, without limits. So every, yeah. every indicator okay. of the state won't do it. So no, without. Yeah. Okay, everything yeah. stayed managed rather than going to extremes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so just the, this uh, couple of figures. Yeah, the blue line represents the delay distribution before the actual negotiation. You can see 
uh, and then they, we have freedom negotiation, a green line after the negotiation, you can see how the shape changes. And also around this 50%, 15 minutes here, you, know, you, have, you can see how this distribution has changed. If you compute the average for the both distribution, you will get the same line. Well, I don't know where it is. It will be like around 10 maybe. I don't have the figure here, but it's exactly the same average. Next figure is how the strategy is distributed. So M0 here is the name of one of our tactics and we can see here maybe it's too small, but it's 40% of the people choose M0, which is high, it's a very large number, but it's not still, I mean, to get a dominant strategy, you would need like 99% of the agent choosing the same strategy. And it's also the best, uh, the one who produces the best results in terms of uh, delay. Oh, well, delay is in the Y axis, and then we have economic uh, trade-offs in the X axis. So most of the people just choose the, the best strategy for them, which is M0, and then we have uh, G1 was the second one, which is 18% uh, of people choosing it. So yeah, and you see there are very some receivable strategies here. So this is just to check that there's no common strategy for all the agents. And in the last figures, you can see how the results stabilize. For instance, you can see how the total delay stays almost the same because we, as we said, it's just slot swamping. So you don't you use all the capacity available, and the cost is goes. For the first, which is just uh, 100,000 euros, and then go back, go down a little bit, and then it's stabilized about the second round here. You have round one, two, three, four, five, until 30. And well, the rest of indicators are also stabilized, and there's no, there's no indicator that goes up forever or down forever. So this is, this is a sample of the results, and the whole set of results can be found in the variables. So what's our conclusion of using the Cache APS platform? Is that why are we interested in using APGIMS based modeling? Typically, previous work has been done in using analytical methods, and although they're very insightful and you can produce very nice results, the problem is that you cannot put the same strategies and tactics inside of them. For instance, the work of Castelli, I don't know if you're familiar with it, it's a pretty, very good paper reference in this field. He proposed different mechanisms to uh, change swamp slots and they compute a minimal cost distribution. The problem is that he requires a perfect information, which of course violated our minimum undisclosed information, which was uh, you don't put all your cost for the others to see and you are no longer anonymous. But with this mechanism, we also fulfill these two properties. Also, even if you try more sophisticated analytical methods, you cannot use these adaptative strategies. So there's no way you can do it with the classical methods. So somehow using analytical methods will restrict the complexity of the strategies that one can study. I would say this is the main point of using ABM for this case study. Well, the reason is that sometimes there's no even a way to formulate them. And of course, I hope this can prove that using Casio platform, one can deliver a better mathematical framework to design and test. It's kind of new concept for ATM. And of course, this is this. I hope this can prove that using Casio platform, one can deliver a better mathematical framework to design and test. It's kind of new concept for ATM. And yeah. I think this is all. Now we'll leave you with uh, Arturo, I think. He will present case study one. Well, good morning, everybody. I'm going to present a case study one that, as you have been able to check, uh, is uh, coming in the position number two. The case study one is uh, referring to local environment restrictions that may limit airport terminal capacity. That was one of the top items in the meeting with the stakeholders that we made in London and uh, I think it's particularly interesting for the European situation in which uh, the impact of the environmental effects in the area around the airports is extremely important for the growth of the infrastructure and is also affecting uh, in a certain way the, term the area terminal capacity. In the case of the European Union, the policy that has been adopted is the same policy that was indicated by ICAO, that is the so-called balance approach. That means that first uh, you try to reduce the noise uh, at the source, let's say getting aircraft that produce uh, uh, lower levels of noise, 
Uh, secondly, you try to optimize the operation procedure in such a way that uh, less people will be affected uh, by noise. The third one, and probably the most difficult one, is the land use planning. Let's say, uh, put people away from the noise. That is, as everybody knows, is quite complicated uh, due to the economical and financial uh, repercussions of the, these land use uh, procedures. And the fourth one, and uh, uh, the ICAO says that the fourth one should be used as a last resource when all the other things has proved not to be enough to control the environmental impact is the operational restrictions. So uh, you can do a number of things. You can do things that uh, put market-based instruments to work there. You can impose taxes, uh, charges, any type of economic penalties related to the impact of noise. You can simply uh, prohibit operations at certain hours of the day of every aircraft or only the most noisy aircraft. Or you can do in a select uh, measures saying this type of aircraft are not allowed, these others are allowed. Uh, you can do a number of different things like that. As a consequence, uh, there are consequences in economic terms, uh, because everything has a cost, clearly, in some cases a very high cost. You can uh, have also consequences in capacity, both in the operational capacity of existing infrastructures or in the limitation of the growth of the airports. And at the end, you may have a direct influence on a other number of things like uh, a schedule of the airlines, like uh, uh, network features, or even in the design of the aircraft. Uh, there is a very famous uh, uh, story that is totally true, that the uh, hydro restrictions uh, or noise restrictions at night uh, requires to redesign of a famous very big aircraft that is so-called, uh, uh, some people call them Airbus A380, and uh, this uh, uh, hydro uh, uh, regulation made that all the world fleet of the A380 is burning a certain small percentage of additional fuel, just in order to comply with the hydro regulation. So it has a um, very, very stretch effects all along the system. So we, for this case, uh, we decided uh, to start with a real case, taking as a base the Frankfurt Airport noise night curfew between uh, 23 p.m. and 5 a.m. Uh, no commercial operation is allowed in Frankfurt. This was the result of a very long discussion between uh, Frankfurt Airport and the local communities that was even into the court. But at the end, uh, in order to have a third runway and increase the capacity of the airport uh, at exchange, it was decided that to uh, close the airport to commercial operation at night. The case study number one was considering uh, what happens if other airports in Europe will do the same, and concentrating on the top 10 airports in Europe by number of passengers, and looking at the effect of these restrictions on the airports, on the airlines, and on the local community and at the very end to the economy of the country in conclusion. Of course, uh, we always uh, consider the environmental benefits uh, produced by this type of action. The airlines are the main stakeholders affected by this regulation, so for the modeling we had to create a feature of how the airlines will be reacting. This is not a uniform reaction because that depends on a number of factors, mainly the type of the airlines. We divided the airlines in classical or network carriers, low-cost carriers, regional airlines, charters, and freight carriers and integrators, the big door-to-door -door transportation systems. Each one of these airlines would react in a different way depending also whether, in the case of network airlines, they were having in this specific airport or not, uh, depending also on the availability of alternate airports not very far away, and depending on the difference of timing between the flight that is affected and the starting of the end of the curfew. Let's say if the curfew is applied since 23 p.m. is different if you have a flight at 23.30 
that if we have a flight at 3 a.m., so the reaction is different. Uh, this is a very general relation network uh, between the different uh, stakeholders. Basically, in a very general case, you may have regulators, local authorities, you may have the pressure groups, or green organizations, or other citizen groups that will be pressuring for airport environmental regulation. The airlines that will be the main affected can do a number of things. They may divert flights to other airports. That depends on the, this type of other airports. You may have, you lose traffic, uh, you may have other restrictions. Obviously, there is an economic effect. The airlines suffer an increase in cost that follow the stream of effects. Airlines may increase fares and having less traffic. If you increase fares, normally you, the traffic is reduced. Airlines may reschedule flights, not divert to other airports, so there is an ATC problem in this case. In some other cases, there is simply an airport capacity, so uh, you cannot uh, reschedule anything to Heathrow because it's full, so you have to go to Stansted, probably. It's in some cases, the airlines may demand a more efficient aircraft, like in the case I mentioned before of the A380, so this requires investment, they will see probably more cost to the airlines. This is a very general thing. In this particular application, we went for a relatively simplified case in which the result of the pressure of these groups there is materialized in the application of a curfew in the Pacific airport. We define basically seven scenarios. The central one, we call scenario seven, is the generalization of the ban on night flights to or the other nine top European airports. The base traffic are the data in the year 2011. We are considering that in those top 10 airports, the only duplicate hub, I say the only airline having a hub in two of the top 10 airports is Lufthansa, that has other hub in Munich Airport. And in addition to this global case, with all the 10 airports uh, suffering a curfew, we made a different uh, partial curfew cases. So what uh, we made was, you see the scheme there, uh, decided what happens, case one, scenario one, if uh, Hydro do the same than Frankfurt or a scenario two if uh, Charles de Gaulle do the same. And these are the two largest uh, hubs in Europe, in addition to Frankfurt. So we try to study the effect of the combined, the curfews of those airports uh, two to two. We also try to see what happens in uh, the two airports that has a majority of low-cost carriers, like uh, Barcelona, whether uh, Vueling, Ryanair has the majority of the traffic, or Gatwick, that is a um, main base for EasyJet, for example. After that, uh, in the other cases, we try to do the top three, say Frankfurt, Hydro, Charles de Gaulle is case five. The top five, adding Amsterdam, Madrid is the scenario six, and as I mentioned before, the scenario seven, that is all the airports together. In addition to that, we try to do some sensibility analysis for the curfew. Let's say the curfew now is applied from 23 p.m. to 5 a.m. So we try to do what happens if Frankfurt moves slightly the curfew, slightly ahead. Let's say starting at 22 instead of 23. That is the scenario 8. What happens if it's only 30 minutes? The increase of the curfew is a, a scenario 10. And if a stretch the curfew, a scenario 12 and 14 in the morning. What happens is instead of 5, is finished at 6, 6.30. We do that uh, for Frankfurt alone, and we do that from the 10 airports together. I think this is something that affects uh, very much uh, to the uh, transcontinental flights because uh, a lot of uh, ar arriving flights in Europe are arriving very, very early in the morning. So the curfew in the evening is more affecting medium range of flights. So we try to see how the, this modeling uh, may be applied to this type of uh, sensibility analysis. 
For the simulation, as I said before, the uh, basic traffic database was for the year 2011. And uh, for the economic analysis, we have used European statistics that has a relationship between the air traffic uh, for a country and the uh, part of the gross domestic product that is uh, depending on this traffic. We are counting for the main impacts also in the classical division of direct and direct catalytic cost on that. And uh, for the case of the employment, that is other factor that we try to analyze, we are doing the calculations based on the Airport Council International figures that relates the number of passengers in an airport with the number of jobs created in the region. At the end, the restrictions applied cause important economic effects at any level, let's say airlines, airports, local economy, and the, the effects are growing very fast as you add more airports with the curfew. If you have the effect of a curfew in one airport and the effect of the curfew in another airport, adding up these two, this is lower than having the curfew in both air airports at the same time. So that increases very fast as you add up more and more airports to the curfew. Obviously, the, for this uh, case, uh, we couldn't go for a detailed analysis of the disruption in the network of the airlines. We assume that uh, the reaction of the airlines basically was try to allocate uh, this affected flight in the best way. But, for example, we couldn't say really this is going to affect how other flights in the same aircraft rotation are affected. This is something that uh, well, would require uh, more uh, data than the data we have at hand. So the evaluation of the airline losses uh, we consider are pretty conservative. Respect environmental improvements, uh, there are very local. And when I say very local, I mean are uh, local not only geographical terms, but also in uh, timing. I say, uh, obviously, if you uh, prohibit flights during a certain period of time, you reduce noise to this period of time. But in the global acoustic load of the airport, this is relatively small. So the reduction in noise is made in a time in which a lot of people are sleeping, so this has uh, an important uh, effect in that area. Local air quality practically is negligible. There is nothing really important to see about that. In terms of sensibility of the advancing or delaying the uh, beginning of the end of the curfew, I think in these specific airports the impact of moving from 23 to 22 p.m. is uh, much bigger than going for uh, 5 to 6, mainly due to the number of flights affected. That is a much higher number of flights and the re relocation of these flights is uh, very difficult because these flights are also uh, need to be relocated in a period in which uh, the density of arrivals in other airports is also high. So in this case it's um, much more sensible the period the late evening than early mornings. In early morning most of the flights affected are long-range flights so the perturbation in the network analysis of the airlines may be higher. This is an aspect that we have not incorporated here. Not to talk about uh, diplomatic problems like uh, for example India now has a complaint in ICAO saying that in order to arrive uh, at the good time in Europe, they have to depart at uh, 3 a.m. In, in India, so the noise they, the, that they avoid for European citizens is inflicted on Indian citizens. This is uh, dif difficult to modelize. This is a sample of the results. In general, in an airport, uh, you uh, evaluate for each uh, of the cases in which this airport is affected, the employment reduction, uh, the airport turnover reduction, and the economic losses uh, for the globally, for the region and the country. This is all, all together. We have also evaluating, not everything are losses, we are also evaluating some benefits for alternate airports because they can get more flights. In general, uh, however, the total, let's say you add up uh, benefit and losses is clearly negative. 
So, and economically, that's uh, quite important. What are the advantages of agent-based modeling for this type of studies? I think Samuel made before a very good presentation of the advantages, general advantages of ABM. But for this specific case, there are also some interesting aspects. For example, we have compared the results of our analysis in some particular case in which we have precedent studies, for example, the effect of in Charles de Gaulle, the night restrictions, or the, uh, there are some uh, other studies in the United Kingdom of what happens if London airports in general close at night. In general, the magnitude of the results has a good relation with this analysis, but the thing that is not included in those studies is the results of the reaction of the airlines. Let's say if I close Frankfurt at night and a flight is not going to Frankfurt, it's going to Han, for example, as an alternate airport, normally these studies does not contemplate this second part. So does not contemplate the agent reaction to the restriction. Also, if we have more complex simulation, more available data, we may also restructure the aircraft rotation or the schedule related functions for the airlines. And you can do probably a more complex and probably more accurate effect of the economic losses or even why not gaining in some cases for the airlines, normally are losses. And uh, oh, the last point I like to emphasize is that the model is extremely flexible. So you can do uh, very easy modifications of the uh, stakeholders' behavior. You can say, well, this airline uh, you label as a low-cost carrier. A low-cost carrier has a certain uh, trend uh, to uh, cancel the flights as soon as they are affected, but this uh, low-cost carrier is tied with a uh, other big carrier. For example, Welling is tied on IAG or German Wings with Lufthansa, so they can behave in a different way or a missed way. Who can do it uh, with a, I think, uh, very very little work? Uh, we try to give here a sample of the possibilities uh, that uh, this type of modeling has in the area of the environmental restrictions. Well, that's all I had in my presentation. Okay, thank you. Case three in third place. So um, this is a very fresh case study, only finished a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> so I'll try and remember what we got up to, but it was uh, pretty intense at the end. Um, objective was to demonstrate the usefulness of ABM, understanding the impact of an increased use of variable aircraft speed into a major European hub airport. Variable aircraft speeds, in this context, we're meaning dynamic cost indexing. This is using the, the aircraft's FMS cost index function to attempt to manage the cost of delay by adjusting the aircraft speed. There's probably the maximum you can get out of an aircraft is an 8% increase, which is about 5 minutes an hour, although Airbus recommend up to 6%. We've had discussions with um, various airlines, and for the case study, we've selected plus or minus 3%. Oh, you can increase your speed or slow down a little bit. So 6% um, window. Looking at the, the scope of case study 3, after consideration and considering what data is actually available, we selected Zurich. It's, it's a busy hub airport in Europe. It's actually the 12th busiest ECAC airport in terms of passenger numbers for 2010. It's the, the main hub of Swiss, therefore it's a major hub for the Star Alliance. Um, after, again, careful selection, we chose a particular day for the simulations. That happened to be the 20th of August in 2010. It's a very busy day but it's not unduly affected by any problems. For example, the Friday after had serious weather problems, so there would be much point, much point using that day for the simulations. Again, August happens to be a month we've actually got some data, which helps um, narrow down the selection. In terms of dynamic cost indexing, these, would be, these are applied by the model to inbound flights. 
So flights into Zurich have an option to speed up or slow down. So in the, the diagram, it's not three aircraft, it's actually one aircraft deciding whether to, to speed up or slow down if there's a delay. Like I say, it's uh, inbounds into Zurich, but obviously we need to know how many passengers have actually got connections from Zurich and obviously the costs. So that's, that's the, the, sort of the, the constraint, the limit of what we can look at. We don't know onward um, connections beyond Zurich, so there's no point modelling outbound dynamic cost index, which we're just making it up. But we've got very good data for Zurich. This gives us an opportunity to introduce the four agents in the model. The airlines, which obviously includes the passenger angle of things, that looks after the costs. There's the aircraft, which looks after the, the actual speed element. The airports, not just Zurich, but the, the outbound stations, consider the, the actual delay to the flights. And then there's an overall manager trying to control the whole system. In order to obviously model it, we need the data. And being University of Western, that is my duty to actually say, you know, data is a big thing of the project. We've combined actual real passenger data for Zurich passengers with obviously the actual flights flown. We must acknowledge the help from Zurich Airport Authority and the Zurich University of Applied Sciences for helping us acquire the data. So just to stress, these, these are real passengers on actual aircraft coming into Zurich and where they've actually gone from Zurich. That's the, the connecting passenger side of things. We've combined that with the non-connecting passengers from other sources, and each passenger has their own real fare, which has been sourced from IATA's Paxit's data set. These have been combined with flight data, which we had to clean up to remove uh, unusual flights, to enhance the flight so that we know if they're, say, a regional airline, a full-cost airline, a charter, and then we need extra characteristics like the precise number of seats on board and for accommodation purposes. We have to align it with the schedule because there's no schedule in the actual traffic data where there is in the passengers. No aircraft, having allocated passengers to the aircraft, no aircraft is overloaded. So if the system worked perfectly, there was no delays, every passenger would get from A to B and to C without any issue. These are then, obviously, the next component is the actual costs. These are tactical costs cost of delay per minute, which we've sourced from our earlier cost of delay report. This has been out in the wild since 2011 and it, it seems to have robust values. We've had quite some have positive feedback from airlines saying these seem to match the numbers they use internally. So we're confident that the passenger costs, the crew costs, the maintenance costs paint the right picture for 2010. As Sam mentioned earlier, passenger costs are split into two. We've got the hard costs, which are the, the physical, the actual costs the airline has to pay when there's a problem. So down to regulation 261, if the flight's delayed after so many hours, they have to give them refreshments. If it's more than five hours, they have to either return them. If it's an overnight problem, there's a hotel cost involved. The soft costs looks at the slightly more difficult concept of looking at loss of market share and if you're an unreliable airline, you will lose passengers and therefore lose, lose revenue. The diagram at the bottom illustrates how the different costs apply to the model. So passengers, the hard cost applies on departure delay. The soft cost applies to arrival delay at the final destination. So if you're flying into Zurich and then out again, the soft cost is calculated on your delay at the next destination. And the various phases of flights, the, these... Um, contribute costs to the maintenance side of things. So in this example, the en route phase has recovered three minutes by speeding up, reducing the overall delay, but then it's been lost at arrival management stage. So that's going to be quite annoying for this flight because you've paid that extra money to recover the delay, then you've lost it when you arrive at um, London or somewhere. The scenarios used, these have been built from three main components. We've got the DCI rule side of things, which have been developed from airline feedback from a workshop we held in October last year. These rules are based on what's, what airlines say they do. Some airlines have company policies to always do a certain thing, either we never ever use DCI, we only use it into our main hub, we only use it if we've got a curfew, which is going to affect a flight. Some airlines are a bit more sophisticated, they might have an electronic flight bag where they actually know the passenger connections for their flights. And if it's really sophisticated, they might know that if this flight is 18 minutes late, three passengers will miss a connection. If it's 20 minutes late, six passengers and so on. So that level of sophistication involves drives at the level of um, the rule we're going to use. So at the, the basic level, there's no DCI, which is used for the baseline. The next rule is if you are 50 minutes late or more, 
you attempt to recover all the delay, which is quite a common practice. The next rule is you try and recover to a threshold of 10 minutes, a residual delay. So once you've recovered some delay to 10 minutes, you don't bother anymore, you just maintain that, that level of delay. And the final one is an attempted cost-optimised recovery delay. The next one down is, it's not strictly a scenario rule, but since I'm talking about rules, it's the rules which control the passenger reaccommodation. So if they arrive at Zurich, miss their connection, they have to be reaccommodated onto alternative flights. So that there's rules on how that works. Obviously, there has to be seats available on the next flight. We're only considering direct flights, so we're not making alternative routes. It has to get a direct from Zurich to wherever you're going. And it takes into account Regulation 261. So when the costs kick in, and after five hours, you've got the option of being returned to your origin. The next components are the actual uptake of DCI. We're starting off with very few airlines actually using it, building up to most flights using it. So at the lowest level, we're saying two airlines operating into Zurich use DCI, which is more or less the current situation. The next level up is six airlines, which would be in a few years' time, possibly medium, medium term. And then the last one, where you've got 10 airlines using DCI. It doesn't sound many, but that actually accounts for 65% of arrivals. The final component is the fuel price. We've got the 2010 average fuel, and then we've, we've derived a higher price, which was the highest, we've, highest published fare, sorry, highest fuel price between 2010 and September 2013. This gives us, in the end, 20 valid scenarios for the model, of which there are two baselines where the, there's no DCI, um, but the two fuel options. So an example scenario, which is S011, which you've got two airlines been selected for considering DCI into Zurich, which happens to be Lufthansa and Edelweiss. So you've got a major flag carrier and a charter airline, and they're both part of the um, Star Alliance, so they've got connecting passengers. For this scenario, if a flight is late inbound, if it's 15 minutes late, then it attempts to recover all delay. But obviously, if there's only a maximum you can delay, depending on the length of flight. And overall, this accounts for 7% of arrivals on that day. Moving swiftly on to the findings, for each simulation we've got three broad areas of indicator, predictability, cost efficiency and environmental impact. These will be modelled for the baselines and for each scenario. Rather pleasingly, the baseline results, when you look at DCI hasn't been applied so the flight is late, those late flights, the actual average cost per minute, which is 80 euros, matches what we've reported in the um, cost of delay report from a few years back. So that's, that's quite pleasing. Then looking at the actual results of what the model was chucking out, the first thing is the massive impact that the high fuel has. So any benefits we found of recovering delay for the passengers and the crew is just completely counteracted by the higher fuel price. The next finding was that two of the rules, rule one and rule two, which is or attempt to recover all delay if you're 15 minutes late, or recover to 10 minutes residual delay. On average, there was a three to four minutes improvement in arrival delay per flight, which contrasts with the cost optimized DCI rule, which as expected had a much lower average delay recovery per flight, but was, I think, a little bit unusual. Is there an indication of a flaw in how the uh, rule was implemented? It's probably not quite optimized as we intended. And we seem to be accumulating too much um, delay at its departure. So flights are waiting for passengers, but they're waiting too long. I think that's, that's what's bringing too much delay into the system. Overall, there was one star result for a scenario, which was the medium-term scenario where we've got six airlines using dynamic cost indexing, recovering to a 10-minute delay. And as the graph shows, it's all down to the delay being moved leftwards, so that there's more lower delay costs per flight, which, which makes sense. This scenario is part of the DCI Rule 2, the residual group, and overall they gave the best results. So the best savings were down to recovering to a 10-minute delay and then stopping. There's two reasons for this. It makes financial sense not to try and recover delay to zero. Once you've recovered so much, if you've got no missed um, connections, there's no point recovering anymore. And this is compounded by the underperformance of the cost optimised rule, which may have been better than this, but hasn't been revealed in the simulations. Samuel went on about the benefits of ABM. 
So rather than repeating the same things, we've had a few different unique features. There's the advantage of having individual goals per agent in the model. Each, each agent is autonomous, has its own capability interaction with the other agents, such as the aircraft and the airports. Um, other features, this is the, the first ABM study which is used, so looking at variable speeds, Tchaikovsky delay, which is either deterministic or statistical, which leads on to, this is, as far as we're aware, the only European model which uses real actual passenger data and dynamic connectivities. Thank you very much. Thank you. Just to summarize, we added in the in the agenda one last slide to talk about follow-up, potential exploitation or opportunities that, that we see in this. We have classified this potential opportunity in three levels because we think that they are different in a way or they are different in the, the resources needed to be to be exploited. So as we've seen, we've selected several operational cases and for each one of those, we selected the case study. So the first opportunity for, for exploitation is obviously exploitate the results of the case studies that we already have. Those are very concrete examples for very concrete airports. So the opportunities of exploitation are limited in the scope and we, but we are definitely gonna do it and there is a list of dissemination actions that we've been talking to, to Dirk that they are pending in the following months. So we think that, as you see, we think that in the three case studies there are certain milestones. Since we don't think that there are studies that uh, compare in how detailed they are, you know, if you've appreciated this, but if you count all the different sub scenarios that we've analyzed for each case study, there are like 54 or 55 different scenarios. So there, it's a very complete and very wide analysis of those those concrete case studies. So the second level of exploitations that we could do is to go deeper on the operational uh, scenarios that we've chosen. Although the case studies include very, very detailed analysis and many simulations, it doesn't mean that we've solved all the dynamic cost indexing, all the limitations of airport and terminal capacity, or all the slot trading in, in en route. Of course, we have not solved those scenarios and we truly think that to be designed those scenarios properly and some other scenarios that are similar in, in Cesar, we think that, uh, that these kind of tools need to be used because we don't, we don't think that this can be properly designed with current tools. So a uh, follow-up opportunity would be to go deeper in those scenarios. This one, we don't have anything planned because it's different from the previous level. While the previous level we are totally autonomous because basically we are going to exploit the results that we already have, the second level we obviously would need stakeholders. As Graham was saying, we would need further data, in general, deeper involvement of airports, airlines, etc. The third level of exploitation that we could explore is to widen this technology to use other things that might be interested in the CSR context and might require similar technologies. For instance, we've talked during the project sometimes about UDTP or, or some other operational elements that in general include negotiation between different agents, whether they're airports, airlines, or air navigation service providers, etc. So that will require to bring Cassiopeia to a different level. I don't know if you appreciated during the presentation that this was very wide already. Preparing this presentation, we counted the number of people involved during these two years and a half, and we counted at least 15 professionals. So the whole Cassiopeia is 10, 000, no, 20,000 lines of code. So, so it's, pretty, it's pretty wide, but that doesn't mean that it can model anything obviously for getting into UDP or things like that, we'll need to widen it. But that's basically an option. And that's it what we have for follow-up exploitation or opportunities. And in general, I think we are done with the presentation. Do you guys have any questions? Thank you, David. Sure. Questions? Mark. The first thing I would like to start with the agent-based platform, because that is being the basis for the three case studies. Um, I don't see from the discussions of the three case studies that you needed things like beliefs and intentions and so on. It seemed all to be straightforward, deterministic, rule triggering. Why did you go to the sophisticated uh, system of, a of beliefs and intentions? And 
all the work in the Cassiopeia is not in this presentation. So there's a lot of work which is, I mean, it's more, maybe it's uh, computer science part. And they made a great effort to translate all this, uh, let's say, ATM perspective of view things or very deterministic rules into these uh, BDI models. And yeah, of course, then again, we are here and mostly presenting the results every case study and not really representing how these agents and how are the beliefs, intention, and, and so on. Give an so, example. For example, if you have the population of low cost airlines, for example, mm -hmm. if you use an intentions, belief, and so on, not that I would expect that these airlines are all behaving differently because they might have different beliefs, because they see yeah. different pieces of information, and so on. Whereas in a rule based system, with the way it was, uh, at the high level at which it was presented, I would expect that all be then the that category of airlines would all be behaving the same, roughly. So, what was the situation there? You had different, they had different beliefs, different views on the information, and yeah, depending on the case study, some of the case study uses every airline has a different intentions, but in some of the case study, we just put all the same in the same category, and in, in the same category, they all use the same intentions and beliefs, and so on. And, but the good thing is that you can change it afterwards. It's not very difficult. It's just an XML schema file, which is might sound very difficult, but it, it isn't. It's not uh, you need to go into the code and everything. You can parameterize everything from the outside. I still don't see so why question, it's not just rule-based. The way this is coded is that all airlines, they have a set of actions that they can take, right? And a utility function that they need to maximize, right? So, but not all the agents, not all the instances behave the same. So it's exactly what you're saying. It's like every instance of an airline will trigger the actions needed to maximize their... Own. Yeah, but in the rule-based system, the, the agents will still have state and they will still act on the state value to trigger a rule. But then it's still rule-based. It's not just with beliefs and intentions. I mean, it's another level of sophistication that these models could introduce. And my question is whether you've used that level. Or whether it's just, you know, I have value 5 for my cost, so I do this, and I have value 6, so I do that. That is just deterministic. Oh, what you are saying is like, if we have introduced uncertainty in what airlines could see, right? I'm not sure uncertainty is the right word for belief and intentions, but it, it adds a level of complication. You know, I believe what he is doing is dangerous to me or not, and I know that I know that he knows, you know, all that kind of stuff. Of course, uh, yeah, you can sophisticate this as much as you can. I mean, we, I think that we've, we've gone through what we thought it was reasonable for the airlines. I mean, basically, they see an environment, they compute what they could do, and they have a strategy. And every instance will follow a different strategy according to their utility function, and will take different decisions. It's not... Mm, yeah, the thing is that you don't know in advance which will be the exact behavior of their agent. I mean, you define some rules and guidelines, and but you don't really know what is the agent going to do, because it depends on the other agents and what they do. So it's not exactly if you put all the rules in the table and you can see what's going to happen, because it depends on others' behavior and it gets complicated and messy sometimes. So, so you're thinking that this could be modeled for instance, in Excel or something like that, with a certain rules, right? Or with the good old-fashioned export system or whatever, you know. Whatever. Or through other methods. We, at some point in the project, uh, I think it was probably, yeah, before we started coding case one, actually it's in one of the deliverables, 3.6, something like that, it's called system evaluation. We, we went through a process of modeling all these rules, as you said, right, with a set of rules in an Excel file, and the reason why we did that is that uh, when UPM was coding the case study one, we wanted to follow all the messages exchanged through the different through the different agents, and we wanted to follow exactly the decision we're taking as a validation exercise within the project. Right. So, and Samu can tell you that the, you cannot follow very very easily. I mean, the Excel files they go to sixteen thousand rows like super easy, and the model needs to go further. So, so it's not it's not easy to find any other tool that you can model it through a through a set of rules. I mean, but we can actually I remember those Excel files and how many rounds of negotiation we could follow, and it's it's very easy just to overflow any any of the set to, to 
Okay. Shall we see the questions in Brussels? Thank you very much, for, first of all. I think uh, the study is extremely interesting, especially the three cases. Um, I, I, I do have a, some questions regarding the environmental impacts, so, and that's to do with uh, the second and the third, third cases that were presented. Um, it's quite interesting to see what you've done with uh, the Frankfurt curfew, uh, but I really believe that the, the case should have been also to investigate the trade-off between um, the reduction of noise that the curfew is putting on Frankfurt Airport, but the CO2, the extra CO2 that will be uh, due to the diversion of the flights. Example, or whether there is some strategy so that the airline would be able to land in Frankfurt before the curfew takes place. So I think the CO, there may be an excess of CO2, and it's true that the, the case you have presented was only looking at the fact that you had less flights landing at Frankfurt, therefore you have less CO2. But I don't think that shows the reality. So I. Well, the way I see the study and the results of the case is a bit uh, ambiguous in the fact that it may increase the CO2 emission. So uh, initially, I was thinking that study case should be presented, in fact, in a in a meeting we're having on um, environmental um, constraints. But now I think it's too early to do that, or at least we should. I like the fact that it doesn't cover uh, exactly uh, the environmental impact as a whole. It, uh, it looks at some features, but we need to do some more work before we can conclude anything. So that was for case two. For case three, the third presentation, uh, it said that with the cost index, uh, there would be also an environmental impact assessment, but I can see that in the results of the case study. So I'm not sure what has been done here. So that was for the environmental elements. Well, uh, the, for the case one, uh, the target of the study was local uh, environmental impact. So uh, you are totally right that uh, we didn't uh, calculate what were the results in terms of uh, emissions with global effects like CO2. Uh, probably you are right, I am, well, I cannot say now without doing some calculations, but probably the result of these restrictions are obliging people to fly to less uh, straightforward places and may increase uh, the uh, CO2 emissions. It's something that obviously is one of the uh, additional exploitations that we can do of the model. But in principle, we only calculate uh, noise, uh, uh, carbon monoxide, and uh, nitrogen oxides that were the local uh, effects. But the, in fact, any, any uh, disruption of the airline network uh, may produce a change in the uh, global uh, impact uh, pollutants like uh, CO2. You are mm -hmm. totally right. Okay, and moving to case D3. Um, the environmental impacts we looked at were, were purely CO2. Um, we didn't report them in the presentation because there were, there were no startling findings, it just followed additional fuel burn. So yes, there was additional CO2, but it wasn't um, a startling conclusion. It just followed the extra fuel burn. But yes, there was additional CO2. Okay, thank you very much. Because I, I was also thinking that we could link in fact uh, case two to case three um, because I, I know so that in Frankfurt for example if the flight is really just at the time of the curfew they would have to go around for example I was just thinking if they increase the cost index then they may not have to divert in that case and maybe the coupling of the two, those two cases could help as well could be further investigated. In summary for that if you look at the work that you've done in terms of the scenarios you explored, does the model that you are testing support the growth, the combination of these, maybe two of the scenarios together to generate a larger uh, review and larger data? 
Yes, in principle it will be possible to run two scenarios at the same time, although the scenarios have to be compatible somehow in time and, and, and scope and everything. But for case study two, as we have seen it, and three, yeah, in principle it will be possible. It's nothing we have contemplated for this project, but yeah, the, pa the platform should allow it. Okay, good, yes, of course, compatibility, of course, but uh, yeah, it was the principle of being able to extend the, um, the modeling to uh, to this wider wider scope. Yeah, thanks. I just uh, actually wanted to, to congratulate you. I think it's a very, very good study. Mm -hmm. And also on the last slide, which was presented by David, I just wanted to um, to understand a bit better what are the priority results you would want further to exploit in the long-term research area. When you say long-term research, I mean, I don't know exactly what you are thinking. What okay. next? So, yes. Future work. Okay, so what you are, okay, yeah, I got it. So what you are thinking is like, if some of these, some of these uh, results could fit into a, into a long-term research strategy. Well, in general, I think that we've, we've tried to make a point on the lack of design tools for certain operational concepts. And we've tried to make a point about this particular technology of agent-based modeling and, and its usefulness in, in some of the, of the designs of the operational concept. So I think that in the long term, what well, it would make sense is to include uh, further development of those tools. Uh, I mean, I, I don't know the details of, of all the tools that might be developed as part of the research work program. However, uh, looking at the, at the simulation tools that we have in hand, or that we've had traditionally in the, last, uh, in the last 10 years, like simulators, etc., none of them can, can model the interaction between agents. So I think that would be the fit within the long-term research. Uh, Stella, I know you want to hear it from the consortium, not from me. But there's something that occurred to me was was listening to the presentation, and that is that case study two and case study three, in a way, they've tackled the same question uh, with a totally different approach. And the question is, what is the optimum delay? So in case study two, you had, you had this effect that uh, people who had more than 50 minutes delay tried to swap it slots with people who had less than 15 mm -hmm. minutes delay. So there seemed to be some sort of margin at 15 minutes. And in case study three, you found that the strategy where airlines tried to reduce their delay up to, uh, to, to a 10 minute residual delay actually produced reduced cost compared to a no do nothing scenario and also compared to a scenario where the airlines try to recuperate all their delay. So in a way both scenarios address the question what's the best delay and now it would be easy to say well it's 10 minutes no it's probably not because it's probably not just X minutes it probably is different and different under different circumstances so for long haul flight maybe the delay the optimum delay is, is different and it it depends on a number of, of factors so uh, an interesting question I think that would come out of this study would be what is the optimum delay and on which which factors does it depend on yeah thank you very much Dirk. yeah that is a very relevant you know, uh, Andrew you Thank you. I just have a small point to add on uh, Sylvie's comment. Is that um, we can see? I think another interesting aspect to come from the uh, the different scenarios is the sensitivity on the on a relatively um, realistic change in fuel price changes the type of uh, solutions we get and changes the behaviour of the uh, the agents and the outcomes. And we can actually see we are, with Dirk's permission we can send you a copy of the deliverable, Sylvie, that we can see with the cost optimization rules, although we need some fine tuning on the way some of those algorithms are working with respect to minimization of the onward passenger costs, because the cost optimization rules specifically allow for the aircraft to slow down if there's no point speeding up to make a connection, we can see some uh, reductions in emissions uh, within some of those, on some of those flights, which is currently not common airline practice. It's, it's much more common for the airlines to have this rule of thumb which is driven by high level policy um, within the airline, driven by um, punctuality um, uh, policies on, on time performance, that they don't want to have 
and the purport, they'll have like an, 80, an 85% target of arrivals within 15 minutes. But the airline doesn't have a fully, um, a, a properly quantified model for why they're doing that. It's because it's determined at a high level um, within the airline's board that they're going for 85% on-time performance. And what we hope we can demonstrate, um, and certainly some of the airlines we've spoken to within the workshops we run, um, are interested in understanding exactly what, how to properly quantify those rules and certainly to see the impact, including on emissions, by slowing down in certain circumstances rather than speeding up, which is far less common, uh, common practice. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, in just to add uh, very briefly that in terms of environmental impact, uh, in Europe uh, we don't have a, a good model that represents uh, global environmental impact uh, adding up uh, local regulations and uh, considering the inter interdependency uh, between the different effects as uh, was mentioned in one of the previous questions. This is something that uh, I believe that would happen sometime in the future. Uh, the, the US uh, has a, a modeling system uh, pretty deterministic that is not working very well as, and uh, I think uh, there is a good opportunity of uh, doing something that's uh, somewhat better and uh, able to uh, get a, a good feeling of uh, how a, a local or partial a zonal regulation uh, may uh, have an influence and repercussions on the global system. I think this is uh, probably the, the best approach I can imagine for this type of uh, modeling. And those are the models that are used in the, in the ICAO negotiation. Yeah, this is exactly what I had in mind, actually. Uh, as I can see here, uh, maybe a, a kind of additional model to our tool suit uh, to, to deliver um, the result for impact assessment we would like to run and environment. Yeah. Thank you very much again to, to the presenter. Thank you very much. Very, very good. Very professional and very in interesting presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you.